Don't be sorry to ask a question. Thank you for this class, class. Everybody is going to rise up and say, 
say that's not right. You have to have some agency. The seller must be represented by both the listing agent and the selling agent, and we don't want any of your new laws. So we put in all this business stuff, and you disclose this, and you sign that, and you fill this out, and so on. Do you know how much litigation there was against that from 1988 to now? Opposing California's agency laws? Nothing. I mean, all but four states have adopted it. What a concept. The buyer has a right to be represented. Wow. So that's why we fuss so much about agency. We were sure, we were certain, we were going to be litigated up to here and there'd be no decision on how to handle agency. The whole idea of sub-agency, and a lot of guys still wandering around that look a lot like me, old ball, who still believe that there is such a thing as sub-agency. There's not been sub-agency in California for over a quarter century. The seller's <coughs> agent is not the sub-agent. I'm sorry, the buyer's agent is not the sub-agent of the seller. That's why we made such a fuss. Agency is a fairly simple thing in most other places. Not here. Anybody have any questions about the agency? Because we're going to talk about it a little bit. I have page two. I have a disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships. The famous form AD. Mark page two here. I think we have in the form of I don't know. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. We said you have to tell who represents who in order to have a legitimate agency relationship with one or the other, or both parties, <coughs> the agency. The statute permits dual agency as well. And this document has stood the test of time. We've got a few very nice lines. This document simply says, here's how agency works. It is not a buyer-broker contract. It is not a seller agreement to take commission. It is a piece of paper that says, Agency is structured in this way, and you as a buyer or a seller or a tenant or a landlord or a person who is getting a property management is entitled to see this before you sign any other document. Put that right up there at the top of the chart. You'll crank out 35 different forms before you finish the listing agreement. But remember that this one comes first. And it's very interesting what it says about how agency works. A seller's agent has a duty to the seller, a fiduciary duty of utmost care, integrity, honesty, loyalty, and feelings with the seller. The buyer and the seller diligent exercise of reasonable skill and care in the performance of the agent's duties, a duty of honest and fair dealing and good faith, a duty to disclose all facts known to the agent, material, protection, <coughs> value, or dis desirability of the property that are not known to or within the diligent attention and observation of the parties. An agent is not obligated to reveal to either party any confidential information obtained from the other party that does not involve the affirmative duties set forth below. How many have ever seen in the MLS, divorce versus sale? Better have that in writing for both parties. Why would a buyer think divorce versus sale is a good thing? Maybe I'm getting to knock the price down. Those of us with a little experience know that it does happen that way. So if you're going to use something that is private to the party you represent, you might keep a lid on it unless they give you permission. The buyer's agent, gee whiz, it says the same thing. A fiduciary duty that most care, integrity, honesty, and loyalty and dealings with the buyer, diligent exercise, etc., etc. Exactly the same litany that is involved with the seller. The duties are identical. But what about dual agency? How many of you think dual agency is a good thing? How many of you think it's a bad thing? I think a balance is a good thing. If you do it right, we'll talk about how to do it right. In dual agency, all the duties are identical, except down here, just in paragraph B, representing both the buyer, seller, 
relevant party, the agent may not, without express permission of the respective party, disclose to the other party that the seller will accept a price less than the listing price, or that the buyer will price pay a price greater than the price offered. Pretty simple. Now let's talk about the agents because that's what that's talking about. It's your listing. I'm representing the buyer. We're both dual agents because we both work at the same place, right? So we're dual agents. You represent my buyer, and I represent your selling just as much as the other guy. The law presumes that you're not going to talk about the price. What it says is, whatever you tell me, you can say, Gene or they'll drop the price 10K. I say, good, I'm delighted to hear the price. My people will come up 10K and we'll meet the mirror middle. But we can't tell them that. We can know ourselves, but we cannot tell them that. To do so is a breach of our dual fiduciary. Yes. What about the one agent that's I'll get into that. There's a very good scenario for that. And we'll, uh, some of my colleagues here will have to suffer through it again. But it amounts to this. Buyer and seller both hear the same thing. But I don't think. So then we have agency. We'll come back to it from time to time. Be sure. You get the sign. Be sure that you, if you're representing the seller, as you go along, that you send this copy off to the listing agent. Let's turn over here to page four. Required disclosure. Now, I'm not sure that this is definitive, but it is. I got it to the most recent standards that I can find. We have essentially. Uh, five different kinds of sale and purchase. You have an equity sale. You have a short sale, which is the same as an equity sale, except there's no equity. You have trust, you have REO, you have probate. Take a look across those forms. Out of the five, only the transfer disclosure statement is required in only two. Trust, RDO, and probate are not required to give a transfer disclosure statement. A natural absence disclosure, again, only two. And we'll talk about how we get around that particular bond. The bond act. And then you'll come all the way down here and smoke detectors. Apparently, people don't burn to death the night that it's still closed if they have bought from a trust or probate. They do if they bought from a bank. Explain that anomaly to me. I guess the houses are safer. <laughs> actual hazards. Well, what are actual hazards within the meaning of the law? It's the first six items. On an actual hazard disclosure, any trustee and most banks that are REO and any executor or administrator of the probate will almost invariably provide you with a professional natural hazard disclosure because they have to disclose what the natural hazards are. When we get to that, we will discover why none of us are confident to do it for ourselves. CAR has a form, very dangerous. How many of you can define an earthquake fault? You know an earthquake fault. How many of you know if you live within 600 feet of the center line? Right there, you're lost. <laughs> Don't touch the natural hazards disclosure. Get the pros to do it. And there's a whole series of things. Form of non-form seller, carbon monoxide. Interesting, we're not required to disclose that we have a carbon monoxide. I'm sorry, we're required to disclose that we have or we don't, but we're not required to put it there except inadvertently. When we get to that, be sure that you, you know what you're talking about. All of these are things that are required to be disclosed by the seller. When you get down to short pay, the SSA, uh, there should be yeah, SSIA is required also. What you need to do is to take this along with you. Stick it in your notebook, put it on your, when you get a look at it on your iPad. This is a pretty good value of what you need. And if you're sitting with an equity seller, let's pretend that it's the best of all possible world by the way, of sales in the uh, in Sierra and LS size one for equity sales. Wow, what a difference. But let's pretend you get a listing of one, and you get the legal listing. 
Everything in that first column says, yes, you've got to have sign. You just have to. Or, in the case of the uh, natural hazard disclosure, you've got to have a professional one. So let's talk about some of the forms. Turn to page two, five. The seller advisory. How many, be honest, how many have ever read it? How many of you use it as a selling tool?
You must prepare, this is statutory duties, you must prepare and deliver the card among other things, your real estate transfer disclosure statement, okay, so TBS, a natural hazard disclosure. You have a legal obligation to honestly and completely fill out the TBS form in its entirety. Now, when we get to the TBS, you'll see that it's a pretty flabby thing. But we have a little thing we like to poke in there called seller property trust. It's not required to anybody. But if you put it in the contract in paragraph 11 and mark it, and they sign off, they have to provide it to you. We'll talk about that in some detail. But the object here is to get the seller to come clean. You don't hear about my house during the next eight seconds. My house is 55 years old. I've kept it in good condition. There are things that I have done that I don't remember. <laughs> Yesterday. Um, <laughs> I was surprised. We lived there about 10 or 12 years, and the house was in about 25, 25 years old. I was digging the back garden, I came across the garden. I was worried about that part of the lawn. I came around. It had a more powerful swimming pool pump station in it. It's a garden hose. It was a task, garden hose, two pipe, garden hose, pipe. Somebody, somewhere along the line, put in about 50 feet of garden hose. I looked at that thing. I said, well, I'm not living in there until about five years ago when I replaced the whole thing. But I would have forgotten that if I had replaced the just remember it's what they can remember at the time. There's another thing, paragraph B4. If the TDS, NHD, or alleged military ordinance, commercial zones, and da 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 provided the buyer, after you accept that buyer's offer, the buyer will have three days after delivery to terminate the offer. Why it's important to get it done in This is the first time I can find, going back and looking, where a buyer had a unilateral, <coughs> unqualified right, with no reasonable standard, to just say, oh. Again, have you ever had a buyer do that? How many of you advise your buyers that they have the right to do that? How about a breach of fiduciary responsibility standing there? You have the firm to do it. You say, hey, buyer, we're going to get a thing called a TDS. We're going to get a thing called an NHD. When we get that, you have the right to cancel the contract and get your money back. Do you have an obligation to say that? Everybody not. How many do? Not many. Well, that's because you're not distracted by the dolphins. <laughs> Please, remember the fiduciary responsibility does not go as far as your wallet. It stops just short of your dollars. If you make dollars out of being a good agent, you'll make lots of them. So don't pay corners, and for heaven's sake, don't put yourself in a position where you have to spend a fair amount of the dollars that you earn trying to prove that you did or acknowledging that you did not do what you were supposed to do. <coughs> Here's another nice thing about this one. For years, it's been required that a death in the property be disclosed. But you have to ask it. Here it says, death in the property. You're going to have to answer that question. It saves you the responsibility of kind of looking at the, at the other main chair over there by the fireplace and the little old lady sitting there and you look around and you're sitting on a straight back chair and say, uh, 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 I recently? Oh, really? Well, sorry, we just put that down. Now, and when you get to this, another thing about the SPQ, one of the required answers, they have to answer that. I've been, when age when I listed and so on, we did our contracts on the same panel. I have been into a house in which the people were selling up and moving back to Ohio. And when we walk through the house, here's a room, look at her. And all the sorts. It smells like my house smells, it smells like babies. 
But he could look at him and say, kid died. <laughs> he was a high ass. Um, are you moving? Well, we thought the job would be better. Um, uh, are you selling a house furnished? Uh, I don't know why. People don't like to come to grips with death. Most of all, they don't like strangers asking about it. We are a society that really has a, a, a gross with death all the time. They're very satisfactory. No, you don't have to do it. They must answer it, they must answer it honestly. Suppose you're listing your neighbor's house. <coughs> Do you know that he died? No. That's the funeral. Better show up when you're at it. Remember they put down, you better show up when you're at it. Talk about that as you go on. Condominiums. Sorry, I said tell the buyer to come. This is now page 6, paragraph 3a. The buyer may request as part of the contract to consider the property. Did you pay for repairs of the property and other items? Your decision on whether or not to comply with the buyer's request may affect your ability to sell your property. G. How many of you get requests for repairs? And a lot of them turned down two years ago. I'm sure the market is involved in that. Take care of it. Hold on to the next. They're not going to turn down anymore, are they? You can get something to escrow. We're pretty happy. You know, how many of you know the MLS and take a look at the three liner? There's the three liners in the bedroom for now. 15 months, even 10 months ago, all the arrows were green and pointed up, right? Go on there now, what are they? Red pointing down. It's getting tough to sell houses. Maybe you better try these people and say, hey, there may be some repairs to you. We'll walk through later on and take a look. And you don't want to repaint the house, you don't want to recarpet it, but you may want to make some repairs beforehand. People will do that. Or they'll be prepared for the buyer that says, I want this repaired. Prohibition against discrimination. Look around this room. Looks like the United Nations. Right? We're down to one line of explanation about no discrimination. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. My generation came all the way through all the evil that was visited upon people simply because they were a different race or a different religion. If you were born in China or Japan, you could not own the property in California until 1952. I have seen in my adulthood signs in the southern part of this country that said, why don't they? Colored people. Pretty much we passed out and pretty much California has led the way. But taking old man's advice, been in the business now 32 years come May, you will eventually run into somebody who says, I don't want to sell to any of those blankety blank, you know, choose the enemy of us. We went through a period when it was uh, Persians, Korean. Um, there was, well, there's a long history of you know, blacks and Jews being idolized. Whatever the, the enemy of the month is, you say, thank you very much for the iced tea, gather up all your papers, So I think you work better with somebody else, walk out, get in your car, and as soon as you can, contact your broker and write a report that goes to your local association. Don't try and preach. Don't try and rationalize. And for God's sake, don't just look the other way. Don't be a part of one of the most hideous chapters in American history, which is the discrimination against the other. Not that. Many of you have run into uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in a variety of places. Sometimes when somebody wants to go to commercial, they go off into something that they have to do. They got into the lead issue very heavily a few years ago and created what was, on the face of it, kind of superficial, but in a way kind of sense of, if you want to do anything with something that's painted in, in the lead-based paint, if you're going to soften it, sand it off, etc., you're going to create lead residue. 
there is a specific way to do it. There are people who are certified to do it. You must do it if it's a rental property, if it's a property that's up for sale, and you're doing it in anticipation of sale. If you want to do it in your own home and it's mother in law's room and you don't care, you can do whatever you like. But don't overlook the fact that if a property is built before 1978 and is being retrofitted in anticipation of sale, the lead paint is probably going to be disrupted. And here again, a story about my house. It was built in 1958. I know it has lead there. I put two coats in it on before it became out of Then I covered it with acrylic. All the facial work on my house. Very fine wood. Been there a long time. All of that has lead paint. It's going to eat whatever there is. If I have to sign it, if I have to sand it down, it all has to be done in a way that complies with EPA if I'm going to sell the house. Marketing considerations. This is not a legal issue. This is something we want to talk about. I don't to help you through all of these other sort of legal things, but let's talk about your house. You should consider doing what you can to prepare your property for sale, such as correcting any defects or other problems. Many people are not aware of defects or problems with their own property. One way you can make yourself aware is to obtain a professional home inspection prior to sale, both generally and for wood destroying pests and organisms such as termites. How many of you have a termite inspection done when you list the house? Good. Boy, that's a bigger show of hands than we've seen in a long time. Fine. Well, some of these notes are going to cost four hundred eighty dollars and four thousand nine hundred. And I don't know how to do it except for the term I Now, the side part of that is that if you have an inspection created, you have to pass it on to the end. If you have two termites reports done because you want to get two different prices and you almost always go, both those reports must go to the market over the period of course of the estimate. Just remember that, but what a great thing to know what you're up against. What the costs are going to run. Where do I go now? Post sale protections. It is often helpful to provide the buyer with, among other things, a home protection warranty plan for the property. How many of you give see to it that a home protection plan is in place? How many of you feel like the seller doesn't want it, the buyer doesn't want it? Okay, how many of you get the seller or the buyer to sign that page in the warranty where it says, I don't want to do this? Uh, how do you know? I didn't know that there's such a thing as home protection. Nobody ever told me it was home protection. Well, yeah, I saw that in the contract. I didn't know what it meant. They didn't explain it. How many of you on a listing appointment tell the seller there is coverage, partial coverage, small coverage, but some? For you during the listing period and period of escrow. It costs 72 cents a day, which I'll pay at the close of escrow. If escrow doesn't close and you go off market, there's no charge. How many of you tell them that that's available to them? Well, that's three more than raised their hands this time last year. If I have to replace the firebox on my heater, or I have to replace some small component, in the air con. And you didn't tell me I could get that for 72 cents a day plus a service call. You may find yourself buying a firebox for a year or a compressor for an air con because you have an affirmative duty to tell them this is available to you. If you don't tell them, you may assume some liability for their ignorance. Don't put yourself in that position. Safety precautions. Advertising and marketing your property for sale, including but not limited to holding open houses, placing keys, a key safe lockbox, directing for sale signs and disseminating photographs, videotapes, and virtual tours of the premises may jeopardize your personal safety and that of your property. In an easier day, people would leave out cameras and money and so on, and much of the time nothing happened. You really need to caution them now. Probably the most frequently stolen item nowadays. Prescription tranquilizers. And right behind the drug out teenager taking him out of the medicine cabinet of overdose. Not a happy picture. 
picture, but it's the way it is. Let's go over to page 7 down in the lower right hand corner. Disclosure and consent for representation of more than one buyer and the seller. This is something that needs to be kind of nuanced. Not much of a problem. You just list a house and then the person across the street wants to list it so likely you're doing it. And you list it and the house that you're sitting open that you listed last week, you're sitting open this week, you said sign me up by next week is sold. And the first time you signed up, you get another house and the people want to go to it. Well, some of us can get upset about it. Well, why didn't you sell my house when you showed it? But they just didn't want it. It's a little different. And we'll talk about it when we get to the purchase contract. I think it's a little different when you represent two separate people who have purchased the same house. They can say, oh, it's all right. And they must. You have to ask their agreement. But isn't that kind of a winning sort of thing? How can you not finger the all cash 10% over price 15 day escrow? versus the FHA, 45-day escrow. Whatever the seller has to say, how can you, in your heart of hearts, be neutral about that? How is your moral compass? Now, if it's pretty straightforward, if it's an REL, the flat price, the way we go, and you're working with two investors, hey, I'm sorry, Joe, but Harry wants me to make it all the same. No, I don't Harry why he gets it all the way over. It's a different story. But really get to the meat of it with your individual buyers when the time comes that you must represent two buyers for the same property. It's very, very important that you understand that even if you get this thing signed, there is no comfortable way around that dilemma except full, frank discussion and then following their wishes, not yours. In general, I would leave it up to the first person who came to you and said, I want you to make an offer. When the second person comes along, you probably want to say, I'm already representing somebody there, you want me to represent you. And then you've got to talk to them. You had a question. You did. Okay. Here's one that really stuns some of us. Non-confidentiality of offers. We always were taught. Is there kind of a business? Yes, so do now. If I make an offer, I say give it to you in good faith. Well, it turned out in the early part of the last decade, we discovered that it was not true. We thought these bad guys were showing our offers in order to get higher offers.
it's all verbal. I never say, well, prove it to me. I guess if I did, they would. But I'm just trusting the agent that they do. Well, and I think that's perfectly good. I think we have to go around trusting people until they prove otherwise. You know, they're smelly rights. They're bad guys out there. But it's perfectly ethical to talk about being. He says, oh, yeah, come in a couple thousand higher than yours, and then somebody comes in 4,000 higher. It's out there. That's what I meant. It's more, it's more of a verbal thing with the agents than on states. Again, rule of thumb. If you're prepared for an oral commission check, you all do. <laughs> if you say, do you have a full price stock? He says, yes. You say, fine. I'm giving you an offer that's more than that, and get it over to me. Let him come back at you and say, thank you, go do that. The chances are very good if you have a property with that is that high. You can just see this thing bouncing up to the point where only somebody who's all cash and doesn't care is going to get Now that the market is beginning to change, now that we are getting two, maybe three offers on properties at this time last year, we've been getting five or seven or thirteen. The dynamics change. But your responsibility remains the same. If somebody says something, it has to be the right word. It is meaningful. How many of you know of a tragic situation where an agent let a buyer into a house just before the close of the escrow and the escrow didn't close? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they said it was okay. The listing agent said it was okay. What's the listing agent say on a purchase agreement? Oh, that here says I get a commission. No. If you want to do oral real estate, you've got to be somebody that's sitting at the next desk or that you've done business with for a long time, and you better hedge your ground. Because when you go back to your buyer and say, if we put in one for 2500 more, there's an indication we can take it up. 25 more, he says, it's ours. Because if there's somebody over 35 more, they're going to take it, and your buyer's going to be all upset. The oral real estate leads in a lot of paths. Most of them good, but most of them are bad, are so very, very bad. I just don't want to go there. Please, uh, disappointed people. And that's why we talk about representing more than one person. Now, dual agency is very easily sorted out. Representing two people to buy the same house, you discuss, and uh, you have to take it on a, on a moral level. That's where it's going to how many of you are old enough to remember the term Eastern versus Strasbourg? <laughs> well, about 1982 or three, a fellow named Strasburger bought a house on the hillside in Berkeley. And about three or six or some months afterwards, the whole house just sort of slithered down the hill about 50 feet. And so Strasburger went after Easter. And the trial court said, now get after, buyer beware. There's no rule that says anybody had to tell you anything. Yeah, maybe he didn't know about it, but he doesn't have to tell you anything. So different from the day, right? Well, this guy had a few bucks, so he went to the appellate court. And they said, Cabinet it after. It goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. You're the buyer, you have to know these things. Buyer beware. So this guy said, and he went to the state Supreme Court. And their ruling was very quick, very short, very sweet. They said, we don't know why we are being asked to review this case. It has been a statutory requirement in California since 1870 that the seller and the seller's agent advise the buyer of any property, of any condition of property that is adverse to use or value. <coughs> For 110 years, we've been pretending we didn't have that duty and the seller didn't. And suddenly it turned out, seller beware and agent beware. Everybody said, oh my God, now we've got to be a property inspector. Now the bit, no. What finally came out of it is this very mild, very watered down version of a disclosure. We've never beefed it up very much. We've added a few things. And one of the things that I, my two cents when I'm asking about it, crusade for is making this other property questionnaire a required form. We're going to talk about the SMQ. We're going to see why it's a little better. But here are some very basic things. For me as an agent, the only thing that should appear on page one is the location and the address. Either typed or handwritten by you. 
That's the last until you get to page three. On the door of page three when they finish. Paragraph three is the list page before you take your next entry. You do not fill in any of the boxes, any of the lines, any of the additional information. Do not put any data in there. And remember, very important, here is just above where we start talking in paragraph A. This is not intended to be a part of any contract between buyer and seller. This is not a contractual document. So anything that's said in there, provided it's true, does not bind the seller. For example, a freestanding stroke, a ranch, a personal property, self-protection, like it's addressed in the case of this contract. It's there, and this is a snapshot of what the property is on the day that it's there. But he takes the water softener, he takes the three standing areas, and the refrigerator, and whatever he may have down, by the wall, he's within his rights unless the contract such as what he describes that. But he has to say, yeah, the place has a refrigerator, yeah, the place has a, a range. I don't have to say that it's attached or not. Look at some of these things. Range. Wall of window air conditioning. Heat, oven, sprinklers, public sewer system. What's the story on sprinklers? Do you mark it yes, and they're only for active problems? Maybe there should be some comment about that. Do you think if there's sprinklers only in the front and you mark it yes, that unseasoned buyer who doesn't get a home inspection might reasonably presume there are sprinklers in the back garden? Will your app address that issue? Everybody not. Hmm? The biggest misunderstanding is remote 
that's not a misunderstanding. It's a mistake. Most places they put down two. They haven't seen one for years and the other does work. They put down two. <laughs> <laughs> and there's buyers' agents. <laughs> that's what I wanted. That's because she's got oral I'll tell you what, when I first started this business, one of the more needs of the cell made, among others, in this pre-RPHCA form, was that the all the windows were screened. Why? Well, the dawn of time, we didn't have air conditions. Probably one house in five had it when I went into practice. So we, all the windows were screened. By the time the seller was in Texas, and the buyer discovered there were five screens missing. Guess who bought screens? We had a regular guy who came and did the screens that we paid for. We don't do screens anymore. Everybody keeps the place shut up in air conditioning. What do we buy? You got it. Perfect. Garage openers. What are two things here that are important? Um, the era in which Heavy machinery was used at home. Dad had a wood shop. Grandpa's machine shop was in the garage. And carried a 220-volt AC load. And pretty much in the past. You go through some areas in Pasadena, probably some here along the photo. You'll find the old shop out behind the, the, the family estate. And it's a 220-volt outlet. Tree you know, Touch it and blow up. Most places are 110. Well, we have a question here. This would have 220 volt wiring. Where does the average house, if it has it today, have 220 volt wiring? Goes to the dryer, right? Where does the dryer's got it spot on? You better say yes, dryer only. Because sure as hell, grandson has grandfather's huge press, and he moves it in and he looks around for the 220 and there ain't none. So be sure that you sell it says. Dryer only. And here's one. Roof. Type A. The type, and there's many different types. Most recent are probably composition. Tile is fairly popular. The age is extremely critical. We have an escrow cancel. When the seller was already out of the house and on the way, because very thoughtfully they left two counting two garage door openers and all the mortgage for the roof. And they had represented on this form that the roof was four years old and the roof certification that they left very thoughtfully showed it was 20 years old. So if they don't lie, be sure they don't just do it themselves. But the point here is that things like this are critical. This is a representation of fact insofar as the seller sees it. And you have an affirmative duty to protect the seller from getting mugged after the fact because they didn't think of something or they were not advised that these are the things that you must do. Now, this is a pretty broad brush on page 9 at the top. Are you the seller aware of any significant defects, malfunctions, or any of the following? You've got a chance to price, yes or no, in the market. Interior walls, ceiling, floors, interior walls, insulation, roofs, windows, doors, foundation, slab, driveways, sidewalks, walls, fences, electrical systems, plumbing and sewer, other structural components. Now, most of us live in some kind of a place with a roof on it and walls, and most of the time it has plumbing. And it's very hard to think of. Any of those that have not had a problem, put them in over now. Now, Amy's my property is in a trust, and when we die, the trustee, another kid, a kind of 12 year old lawyer, he is going to have to deal with an awful lot of stuff that I try and remember and put down. Not because the trust is obligated to make any disclosure, but because I think buyers are entitled to know what went wrong. I can't think of anything that we haven't fixed, repaired, replaced, redone. And almost everybody says, no, 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 no. Uh, well, there's a huge crack running down the driveway. I can explain the fact that the uh, garage floor is like that. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, there's a little, little slab problem there. You don't do this, but you make sure they do it as nearly right as you can. Are you going to walk through and do an avenue? Yes. 
Come on, Carrie. Come on, Charlie. You point things out to me, and I'll put stuff down, and you put stuff down. And let's get as much of this as we can. Romex group, or worse than that, the extension cord from the back of the house out to the cash to up. Uh, probably ought to do something about that. These are the kinds of things where you, as an experienced experience, practitioner, have an affirmative duty to do things to protect them. Uh, if you do a PDS uh, strength for disclosure, after you get the listing and it, say the house is on the market for six months or a year, you got to do another room? Or at what point with some disclosures do you need to do a second one? Well, I think that that's a, your point is a good one, and I'm glad you brought it up. It's probably a very good idea, not that they get too stale. I think it also depends on specific circumstances. Many of you recall the night of, of uh, January 16th of 1994. It was 20 years ago this month. Everything was calm, cool, collected, and the house looked like, you know, it had been decorated by everybody and cared for beautifully. And on the morning of January 17th, it was a shambles. So it probably needed a new TDS. The problem in your case is the subjectivity of it. My house is fairly static, fairly stable to old people that there. We see the objects nice and neat and tight. My TDS would probably be pretty good for a couple of months. I, as a practitioner, would not want to get a TDS that was more than about three months old maximum because it's a snapshot of what the seller saw or thought or remembered on the day that's on top of page one. By the way, you better fill in. See that they fill in. You don't want to have that thing done and then six months later put the day in. You want to prevent that. That is a snapshot of the day that they did it. So on the top of page one, they fill in the day to see that they put a correct day. Now, here's where we come to a little change. Installation of a listed appliance device or amenity is not a precondition of sale or cancel the dwelling. You can sell a house in any condition, even condemned, provided that the buyer understands it, accepts the responsibility. Can you sell a house without a heater? No. Can you rent a house without a heater? Nope. Excuse me. Without a heater? If you're going to rent a house, it must have heat. If I buy a junker and the heater's taken out, I can buy that house. You can sell it without the heater, provided it's disclosed and provided the buyer agrees. As a landlord or landlady, you cannot you know what? lease. He's right. You can't get a loan. That's where we're getting confused. As a cash buyer, you can't. Okay. We're not talking about it. the peculiarities of the banking system. I'm just That's another whole eight hour fact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the point is that you can sell a house in any condition, provided it's all disclosed and the buyer agrees to accept that condition. That's why it's so important to put condition out of the You've got some real junkers out there. So you need to be careful. This kind of, this one goes with short sale. Is there probably liable, liability in the short sale for failure to properly disclose? Everybody know that. You have a short pay, the bank approves. People move out, the buyer moves in, there's been a misrepresentation to the buyer, so the seller pays the buyer. Can you get anything? No. Some of them have been paying rent for three years, they got three weeks out of rent. Okay. They talk about quick release mechanisms. And then down here is the standard for a change. The civil, the civil code requires a single family residence <coughs> on or before January 1st, 1994 to be equipped with water conservation plumbing fixtures after January 1st, 2017. Additionally, on and after January 1st, 2014, a single-family residence built on or before January 1st, 1994 that is altered or improved is required, is required to be equipped with the water conserving plumbing fixtures as a condition of final approval. Is that going to be a little tough to sell houses here in the community? If you're the seller, you got to do it. Because there's going to be a checkpoint. 
I know there are city ordinances that a lot of cities require inspections. Not just a little report, it's not a little fundraising kind of thing, an inspection. So be sure that when you talk about this in your Bible, because of course you're going to go through it, you're going to read this and make some comment on page four, paragraph on the report, and you're going to put a it. Be sure your buyer understands this. There are a number of things like this. The last estimate I heard, which is just before the crash, 50% uh, of the inventory in the San Gabriel Valley has had some modification made to it that should require a permit. Almost all of those modifications, something like 90%, were made to what was coded at the time. And a permit was pulled. It was never signed off because if you signed it off, then they add some dollars to your tax bill every year. Guess what? When the code changes, that becomes not only unpermitted, it becomes not to go. So, in this context, it's probably a good idea for people to say right up front, we didn't lose the permit if they didn't get the permit signed off. What do you do if something is out of code? Say the house was built. Well, the big code change, of course, came out of the market we just discussed. But changes occur. Changes occur. What do you do if the house was to code when it was built and it was grandfathered in, and now it's not? Is it possible to do something with that, even as a seller? Yeah, sure. You go down to the city hall and say, me and Culpa, what do I have to do? And then bring out a wheelbarrow for your money so you can get the permits. And then they will ultimately give you certificate of occupancy, provided it was reasonably done to code or through something like what would need to be brought up to standard. <coughs> One of the reasons I've made no major alteration in my house is although every duplex socket has three prompts, I think it's correct. None of my duplex connections in my house are counted. Of course, absolutely code in 1955, didn't have to turn on anything. I'm grandfathered in because it was done with her. If I have to replace the electrical panel, or if I need to do some significant kind of repair to the house, that all has to be changed. Everything's going to have to be grounded. Could I then get a certificate of occupancy for the current code? Yeah, sure. It'd be costly, but it can be done. There are some places where there are key inspections that are done, and they result in the city saying, you fix this. You know, I'm selling the house. You got 60 days, you got 30 days, whatever. But yeah, you get this. If you like it, you sell the house, just get the buyer to come down to City Hall, post them on, and go agree to do it in 60 days. Do people do that? Yeah. We have a lot of that in short term. I'm not going to do anything you want. It. It's up to you to fix. Okay, come with me. We'll go down and we'll meet anywhere at City Hall. And you'll post a bond, and a bond as much. And you'll agree in writing that you'll have this done 60 days after the close of escrow. And I'll have a permit for that. I've got a permit to do it. And I'll come around in 30 days and say we started. And I'll come around in 45 days and say how's it come along. I'll come around in 60 days and say good for you. But the buyer's doing it. The seller has sloughed all of that off. Suppose there's nothing like that. What happens if you're out of code? The buyer takes it. Suppose there's an addition on the house, that beautiful 400 square foot panel room with a pool table, and it ain't code, it ain't permit. Who's responsible for that? The buyer. That's why you just go, because you don't want to be the one responsible for bringing that up to code. Financially, that's right. Major damage to the property or any of the structures from fire, earthquake, floods. Well, how back, far back does your memory go? If you just came here from Idaho and have owned the house two years, you may not know that it was lying in the street in this month of 1994. So it puts a bit of stress on what is it that you're going to do or say. Um, remember that the answer yes is only if they know. Do you or somebody who's been practicing here for 20 years know that that was lying in the street in 1994? Remember, because you know, it was in all paper. We had paper. 
Do you remember? What you should do with respect to that information? I don't know. They say no. They don't work like that. But you remember standing there. You're standing there holding your little brother's hands and, oh, and not trying to figure out what to do, but what would happen? But you saw it. What's your duty? Anybody? Do you have knowledge that that house is lying in the street as a result of that? You think that should be reflected in your head? Not a house fell down because of earthquake, but after the earthquake, the house was in the street. It's something that you can put in there, and you're not drawing any conclusions or making any inferences. Now here, down in paragraph D, is something where I take really serious exception to what CAR has done. Remember the front page that this is not a contract document? What does paragraph D have? It has two contract statements in it that the seller is saying affirmatively exist. Paragraph D at the bottom of the page. Page 9. Page 9. Paragraph D, 1 and 2. The seller certifies the property at the close of escrow will be compliance with section blah blah with regard to smoke detector. How many of you just accept that and don't look for the WHS team here? We represent a Is this enforceable? Yeah. Is it enforceable when it's part of the purchase contract? Yes. Is it enforceable here? Really? Can you cite a court case that says something that is not a contract document becomes an enforceable contract document? I can't. I think this is egregious. If the court wants to come along and say, yeah, that's perfectly good, we don't care. That's fine. One of the reasons we have these gatherings is so you don't just follow along because CAR said so. You come to some of those. If any of you have ever represented a seller who wanted to buy a house before closing escrow and they weren't forced to sell their house when they couldn't find another one, you're very fortunate. We'll come to that. But these things need to be thought through. I yelled like I'd been stepped on. I said, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, it doesn't work for me. CAR legal every now and then will say something, you know, but then it'd be nice to do the other thing.
to would it matter to a buyer? In two years, will it matter to a buyer's attorney? And in four years, will it matter to a judge and jury? And the other rule is, if you have to ask if it should be disclosed, disclose it. <laughs> now, there is no indication in here how long it goes. The SPQ is very clear on something. When we get to the SPQ, it's going to say, by you or some prior owner, any repairs. Any damages repaired with FEMA money. Well, I've been in the house two years, and it's either burned down or been flooded or had an earthquake. How do I know? The answer is you probably don't know, unless you have a TDS from the owners who have it. Is that constructive knowledge to you as a seller? Yeah. Could you include the other TDS along with you? Say this is an attached document that I had from the time I bought this. Would that be a clever idea? Mm -hmm. Takes the history back. It may not be what you as an agent would like to see, but does it protect the seller? Yeah. <laughs> love that question. I love questions. Let me see you this question. I really don't. I don't think we get anywhere at all if we don't have questions. You think I can babble on here as I do, as we discovered less than two hours. I can babble on and you don't get the answer that you need unless you ask the question. And the time to ask the question is when we're discussing topics that I want to share. Yeah. Those questions are great. Let's go back to this business of death. We'll get to it in the answer too. But they want to ask, how did they die? You may tell them that they died of anything that they died of, unless it is HIV related. And then they must say specifically, was it HIV related? And you must say yes. Pardon? Unless they ask. They have to ask. They have to ask. If they say, was it? If they say, how did they die? You say, well, I'm out of stairs. That's fine. Heart attack, old age, cancer. It's a kind of interesting thing. I, I worked in the sanitary valley, plant city, for about four years in the total bankrupt there before I came to town in the country 15 years ago. We had a wonderful little kind of convention. It was a small town, kind of like Medora town, which is isolated by the mountains. It was just growing up. County fire served the uh, the medical needs and they have a sheriff's department. And they have, of course, this kind of private ambulances. <laughs> Nobody ever died in the house. They died in the ambulance on the way to Henry May of the Hall Hospital. They died in the receiving room at Henry May of the Hall Hospital. Well, they were pronounced dead at Henry May of the Hall Hospital. Unless the neighbors saw them lying on the front lawn from a heart attack, nobody ever died in the house. Thirty thousand population. Nobody ever knows who is. It's a polite convention. I'm not advocating it. Now, how many of you, honest to God, can say we do an average? Agent, visual inspection, score. Come on, let's get going. You really, really do it. You do it when you're selling agent. Yeah. Why? Because you want to keep your commission, not pay lawyers. Let's just walk through this carefully. Let's take the worst of all possible words. And are you up? And the buyer says, I'm not paying any $250 to find out if this junk pile has anything wrong with it. Who is the only one who has the burden? You and the other agent. You must make one to four years diligent, reasonable inspection of areas that are normal in the world. It is not an option. I love some of these things. Paragraph uh, Romans 3 at the top and Romans 4 at the bottom are essentially the same. You have an option. See attached uh, to the Apple. Agent those notes, no items for disclosure. How would you like to put a card on that one? <laughs> or how about in three lines or less. Agent goes to the following item. You know what the most frequent and highly inappropriate thing is that? Buyers advise to get a professional inspection. I didn't do a job, I just paid a dollar. You put that down there, or 
Lord is going to come tomorrow. Here tonight. Did you ever go to a deposition to a lawyer's office and answer a lot of questions? Ever have you ever been a, a, a witness in a trial? In loads of fun. Loads of fun. For my sins and my background, because I don't do anything else except this kind of thing and run a few offices, I am what is classified as an expert third party witness. And I sit in lawyer's offices and I drone on about age of conduct and the value of a property or things that, you know, in the real world don't really matter a lot. And it's a bug, don't worry, don't worry anything in the world. I'm not part of the trial. I have sat there when the company was being sued. I have sat there when we were suing somebody. It's no fun. The Abbott came into existence because we did such a lousy job. Can you imagine going to the average house and being able to put out all the things that you see in three months? Or better still, marking it out, see anything. I think that's, that's a temptation to just jump off the bridge of the world around you and have the other end of the tree. You just have to think about this kind of stuff. Do your habit. Mark it. You can mark that. You can mark that when you're preparing the fork. Don't throw it into the rest of the but you mark that. Next one is page 11. We only have an hour to go home, so we'll probably be finished before then until the question starts. When's the last time you listened to the house when the kids came home from college? Grandma and Grandpa came at Easter. Did you either remove the key or get a key safe agreement signed by Grandma or Grandpa or the kids that were over 18? You become liable. You've been here before. You become liable because anybody 18 or over has the right to say, no, I don't want a key safe. And it arose in a rather dull way and it arose from agent misinformation back in the, again, the 80s. A kid came home from one of the high-priced colleges and brought with him a thing called a personal computer. And it was not pronounced in the those days, but it was a personal computer. And it was about the size of a bathtub. It weighed about the same. And it was attached to a screen that looked like the very television screen. And it cost $10,000 and it had 600 points. And he's put it up in his room. He's going to go back to college in another two weeks. And the family all went out to a Christmas party. When they came back and the computer was gone, there was no evidence of force. And in those days, we had the mechanical equivalent of what we now have with the super key. Uh, we had a, a device. You had to put a very strange kind of key in it, and when you turned it, it, it imprinted the code for that key on a Mylar tape. And the police could take the Mylar tape and run and find out whose key it was that got in. Well, they turned it, and they could never prove that the agent or the agent's kids or anybody took it. They found no evidence of it at all. But it was gone, and everybody agreed it was gone, the agent agreed it was gone, and Dad sued the broker. And the trial court said, oh, it's a broker. The broker's not responsible. The house is like, they have permission. They're responsible. Why did they have The appellate court said, can't you read? So the broker's not responsible for any consequences of the future. And what did the state Supreme Court Said, the brief indicates that the owner of the computer was a 19-year-old man who happened to be residing with his family temporarily. We can substitute the 19-year-old man as a plaintiff because he is a proper plaintiff and find for the plaintiff to the extent of the computer. Uh, you ever have anybody who celebrates the 18th birthday of the kids? Of course, if you're listening, run right up and say,
say happy birthday, sign here. <laughs> Anybody 18 years or older will sign a keysafe release, or you may not put a keysafe on there, except at your peril. All the God saving clauses, all the things it says in there about mom and dad are on title and all the rest of it. Mom and dad don't, dad don't count when the kid is 17 years, 366 days old. And Grandma and Joyce is the same. Grandma brings the family jewel for her. Everybody knows she's a fool. I have the same size box. But at New Year's, she brings it. You no, know, and you don't have grandma's signature. You are in trouble. And they get permission. Right. They get permission. Thank you. 
unless otherwise specified in writing that a broker and any real estate licensee or other person working with the true broker does not verify the information provided by the seller. Note to seller, the purpose is to tell the buyer about no material or significant items affecting the value or desirability of the property and help to eliminate this understanding about the condition of the property. As we go through this, you'll recognize some of the things that come out of the TDS, and there are embellishments of that. There are a TDS question on steroids, because the answers are very, very detailed in some cases. Why is it good to know this? Why is it good to have E&O insurance? You know, you just, these are all risk management issues, especially for the seller. Now, there is a form for contractual uh, statutory contract, contractual disclosure must be made. CAR ran the two weeks to a parallel for a while and said, oh, wait a minute, let's put the contractual and statutory requirements <coughs> right in the front of the SPQ. And you hand this to your seller and say, look, you have to answer those first nine questions. That is not an option. And while you're doing it, go through and supplement some of the stuff we put in the transfer disclosure statement. You will be better served in court if it ever happens that way to put down the information, good or bad. The bad will probably, if it's really bad, will be discovered during inspection and people will throw it out. If they have a chance to see it here, they'll have a chance to think about it, they will be responsible. So when you hand this to them, say, win, lose, or draw, do the first time. I don't think you have problems getting this out of the buyer, sorry, out of the sellers. For years, you have trouble getting other agents to get it out of their sellers. So we have really had problems. The answers are based on actual knowledge and recollections at this time. How's that fit? Something that you do not consider material or significant may be perceived differently by a buyer. Does the buyer care if something was damaged 50 years ago and it hasn't given a fit for 20 plus? <clears throat> Think about what you would want to know if you're buying the property today. Read the questions carefully and take your time. And here we are. Come down to paragraph Roman 5, letter A, number 1. We're off the hook. Within the last three years, has a death of an occupant of the property occurred on the property? I worked my way through school as a cop in Pasadena. Giving a death notice was terrible. Reminding people three weeks or two months after the fact of the death of the real estate agent was ten times worse. Because he's parading across a nerve that is trying to, to heal. Then there's a whole series of things, government and health officials, release of illegal controlled substances, insurance claims affecting the property within the past five years. Have any of you ever recently run into a problem with insurance? Any insurance for the buyer? Was it the buyer who made three claims against his landlord or was it the property that had five claims in five years? Now, they keep track of that. And you know what they did? We had a case in Claremont, a year or so ago. There were claims, there were four claims totaling something substantial on the other side of $15,000. So they said, okay, we can't insure this house to the buyer until we see that the work's been done. So they came out and did, you know, two or three years. They got out all the receipts they could find, and they pointed here and they pointed there. The rough shot was, before anybody could insure that, the seller had to pay the insurance carrier $7,000 to $15,000 back. It's a very big computer somewhere in the East Coast called Clue. It's, it's, it's industry wide. Insurance is terribly important. If there has been more than two claims, if there have been two claims or more in the last five years, at least be aware of it. Ask them about it. The seller is an investor who doesn't know who's an insurance company? Any of these, not specifically that. Yes, the answer is he was is he a human being selling? 
one to four units. If he's asked to do it, he agrees to contact him. If he knows, no, he doesn't know. Mark, no, I don't know. The burden is on the part of the that he did. Repairs and alterations. Alterations, modification, rebuying, replacements, or material repairs on the property, including those resulting from home warranty claims. <coughs> How many of you remember the big blue ha ha when we went from Sear 10 to Sear 13 water uh, you know, space heaters circulating here? Or here? Yeah, had to knock out a wall to make the cabinet bigger to take a footprint of the 13 seer heater. Because the 10 and the 8 went before the 6 and went before that all fit the same place. That's a home warranty. A lot of home warranty companies covered that. A home big enough to wall, move it six inches, home warranty. Mm -hmm. On and are recurring maintenance on the property. On and bright, haven't you lived in a house somewhere? that needed a roller rooter twice a year? Sure. Over the course of time, even if you get old enough and live in enough places, you won't have that occur. That is a recurring problem that should be reported. If they don't, and the buyer runs into it, it might not be too hard for the buyer to prove that the seller did not disclose it, particularly if they get the same roller rooter coming out to do the work. Nothing quite so embarrassing as calling and saying, my air conditioning doesn't work. And Home convention company comes out and says, This is a pre existing condition of some of the materials. All these work beautifully. And they call the same guy up to do it. He said, I told them five years ago to replace the job. <laughs> um, it makes for good short, uh, small things. Very interesting. Has any part of the property, if you turn to page 13, has any part of the property been painted in the last 12 months? Remember that your Adam says, <coughs> stain on ceiling in the northeast corner of meeting room. And you come back and you want to inspect it because you represent the buyer and the seller and the buyer and the seller. And the buyer. Okay. There's no mention of it from the seller. Has the home been painted within the last 12 years? 12 months. How many of you carry a flashlight to go into your attic? What are you using for? Hmm? What are you using for? How about closet ceiling? You ever see anybody haul all their clothes out and paint the closet ceiling before they before they do so? Boy, that's a big giveaway. It's the first place I get. Another place I like to look, although we're not required, we leave them by the statute, is under the kitchen sink. If you look under there, the little animals are falling around. It's pretty obvious. But sometimes you look and there's dry rot. Somehow the termite company calls you there. Call the termite company and say you missed something until you get that fixed. But if you see it, and if you know it, you can't just say, well, I'm not required by statute to do that, so I'll look the other way. Be thorough. Go so, over If this is a pre-1978 property, were any renovations that are saying that's a reserve? We talked about that. We need the A requirement. Defects in any of the following, including past defects that have been repaired. How long ago? Whatever the court says. Heating, air conditioning, electrical, plumbing. Water, sewer, waste disposal, septic system, sump pumps, well roof, gutters, chimneys, fireplace, foundations, crawl streets, attic soil, grain drainage, retaining walls, interior, exterior doors, windows, walls, sitting floors, and appliances. Now, if any of you live in a house that has a roof and walls, doors, windows, and right water, there's bound to be something in that list that is really being fairly recent, the last year or two. If there's absolutely nothing, you live in an unusual place. If there have been a few, better drop them down. If you get a few down and there's another one discovered, you say, I didn't remember. Remember it says relying on recollection. Recollection, I can tell you from the distance, uh, gets less and less vivid. The leasing of any of the following are on or serving the property. Solar system, water software system, 
or a purifier system, alarm system, or propane tank. An alternative septic system. I know you think of, of septic systems and wells as being out that way 40 miles, but there are about four. And if you're dealing with the Coquino West Coquina area, there are several areas that are on septic systems. Fire Road, uh, South Road. They're on septic systems. They don't have wells there. They do have wells along here. There's two or three big gated areas with four or five houses in them. They're all wells. They're huge tanks, multi thousand gallon tanks on the hillside. And they're fed from four wells usually. And those have to be tested as a function of, of transfer. And these people need to talk about it. Here's one for you, disaster and relief. Financial relief or assistance, insurance or settlement, saw or received from any federal, state, local, or private agency, insurer, or private party, by past or present owners of the property, due to any actual or alleged damage to the property arising from a flood, earthquake, fire, other disaster, or occurrence, or defect, whether or not any money received is actually used to make the dirt. Now that's fairly common. Most of us, at some point or another, if we own a house, we're going to make an insurance claim for something. I came home one time in 1988, and a pipe burst underneath the kitchen sink, and we made an insurance claim. And they made good on it. They were great. If it had come through the window and raised on it, it wouldn't have paid anything. But it was a new We made an insurance claim. It was repaired. I remember that. Should I put it down? Yeah. How about the time the neighbor's pine tree came down and took out a third of my garage? It was all taken care of. You can't tell us because we remember the stuff was replaced. The roof was replaced exactly like it had been. But it was done with somebody's insurance money. Should I report that because I remember it now? How would a renter how would a renter's claim against the property? Get a claim against the property. A renter can claim against his own insurance, he can't claim against the owner's property. We're talking about claims against the property. I don't think it's insurance against the property. Well, it is reported to the individual. It's reported to the individual. The individual is also investigated. You will get people getting insured because they make three claims or four claims against their landlord in the last cycle. And then the homeowner. The, the, the landlord equivalent of homeowner insurance is, is structured. Yeah, I just didn't know that somebody had It doesn't count against the property if they made a claim against the rent insurance. It's a very good question. I'm sure that it is originally in other people's minds. Anyway, we're talking about past owners having done something. Man, they're pretty dirty. Okay, water-related, mold issues, pets and animals, boundaries and access to property use by others, landscaping and pool. Now, we're famous in California for using a modification of the old Japanese pool, which is you wouldn't tell if it had a fire underneath it, but we pop the water through a gas fire thing, put out water, and boil your germs on it. You can raise, you can raise a tennis lawn fire, you know, and it wouldn't hot for a long day. And have there been any problems? I don't know, but I have this funny thing between my toes. Uh, you probably noticed this wooden hot tub is pretty much gone by the wayside. Most of them nowadays are fiberglass. Uh, we call them spots because it's a little fancy in the hot tub. Um, but if there is a wooden, a wooden tub there, it is probably well to be sure that your client answers this question. And here we come to the old sprinklers. Operating sprinklers on the property. If yes, are they automatic or manually operated? Are there any areas with trees, plants, and vegetation not covered by the sprinkler system? There's where we get to this issue of sprinklers on the front, sprinklers are back. You see why this is so important in an expansion of the TDS. It takes a great burden off of you to have the seller be on the right. Also, it provides you with some layer of protection if the seller makes a misstatement and it's not something that you can readily see in a visual inspection. 
an operational pool heater on the property. Get in there. Operational spa here. Cross because of defects or extract, and heat scratch repairs or other problems in the central industry. Accommodate, you know, uh, neighborhood. Down here, here's K1. Neighborhood noise, nuisance or other problems from sources such as but not limited to neighbors, traffic, parking congestion, airplanes, trains, like or else, subway trucks, blah 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 blah. You can read that. I'm hard time going to sleep. We got a new disposal noise problem about six or seven years ago. The court said that if the neighborhood teenager opens the garage door and brings five of his friends in and they do heavy metal all afternoon, one Saturday a week, I don't know, a week, it's a disposal noise. We've run into two or three things. We had one in the uh, It's one of these places where you have a lot of common areas where there are walkways and, and greenways and green belts. And I went through from the house that was right, it was a T intersection with just the green belt and walkway. It was on the regular street, it wasn't on the street. And you went past two rows of houses, one facing the other. And you went past one row of houses, and down there in about two houses that way is a one piece engine car. It goes out at 10 in the morning, 3 in the afternoon. Also goes out at 4 o'clock in the morning. Is that a disposable noise issue? I think so. It was four blocks away, maybe not. But I think things like that are disposable noise issues. It's much better to disclose and have to say, I can't hear that, it's not a range, or well, thank God there's a paramedic that close, or whatever it happens to be. But if it's there, disclose it. If you have to ask the question, disclose it. All the point of contemplated eminent domain, condemnation, annexation, or change of zoning, general plan that applies to the affected property. Now, we're not used to seeing that too much because we're trying to build up around here. But as we continue to grow at the metropolitan area, your practice is going to move farther east and south, where there is still some usable land. I'm not talking about infill where there's three lots or there's two acres. I'm talking about something fairly large where we're going to have all kinds of uh, development, all kinds of things going on. Boy, right now some of these zone agricultural uh, residential, some of these multifamily. You can come talk about yourself, but your seller needs to know. If I'm selling my 40-acre grape vineyard out east of here, the ABC development company, I better tell them about putting out there that there's going to be a change in zone. Tendency of any rent controls, that's not too much of a problem. The two rent control areas in Southern California, the city of Los Angeles, the city of Santa Monica, there are very detailed rules for that. If you get involved in the city and it's two or more units, or Santa Monica and it's one or more units, you need some advice local. Bond assessments, construction reconfiguration of closure nearby government facility. Well, it doesn't seem like very much. But the great real estate recession of 1989-2000 resulted largely from the closing of government installation, military contractors, and military bases. And if that's going to happen, our, our company has five offices, one of which is in Marina Valley. And when March Air Force Base went from being a regular Air Force Base to being in Missouri, an awful lot of people went out of work, and an awful lot of dry cleaners and little fish and chip shops went out of work. Just kind of existing. Important to know those things. Whether the property is historically designated or falls within an existing or proposed historic district. How many of you have been to the historic district in Kumar? It is beautiful. There's a large lion at each end with teeth fangs and claws that says, thou shalt not disturb the exterior of these houses. And they will issue a court order and put a lien on the property to prevent it being sold if it does not conform to the exterior to what their photo is considered to show. 
in one to four years. Many of us, maybe in four years, maybe as many as 15 or 20 people in not a smoking tent for the summer. The seller will certify that smoke detectors will be installed at the end of escrow. This form is silent on who will pay for that. And what is the responsibility if they aren't installed? <coughs> I'll tell you, there are two, three things that you just never want to be in a situation to have to contemplate. One is somebody moving into a house with a smoke detector is not been installed and there's a fire. That happened and I wish I took the photograph and the article from the LA Times about 20 years ago. Second section, we had newspapers in those days with sections. Picture of a fine cabinet with two scorch boxes on the top that said the eclipse or somebody smoke detector. They had moved in on Friday night intending to install on Saturday. I don't know how many of you have done it, but I have standing instructions from my colleagues. If you cannot get anybody else to do it, yell. We'll go down to Home Depot and we'll get the requisite number, pay seven bucks a piece, and I'll bring my grubbies and my step and we'll install them. At the end of the day, the cheapest insurance you can get is that that never causes an issue. We have installed over the years, I don't know how many smoke detectors, but the seller did, and I feel very strongly about it. I am less sanguine about uh, carbon monoxide detectors. The statistics were that in the year when we had in, uh, brought together this, this carbon monoxide detector, uh, 44 people total died in the state of California from carbon monoxide, more than half of those from people burning charcoal braziers in the house for heat. I'm not sure but what the people who make smoke detectors did see a good thing coming and lobbying for carbon monoxide detectors. They have to be there, and we are much less inclined to go and buy $25 worth of carbon monoxide detector if it's not there. On the walk through, you better know that it's not there if you're representing a buyer. Carbon monoxide detector not installed. We'll talk about walk throughs and what the options are. Don't let people take occupancy without smoke detector. It's just Extracting the water here is kind of an interesting thing. If it's a really bad earthquake, <coughs> the water here is react to pull the wall over this that it's attached to. But short of that, it's probably a pretty good idea. The difficulty with the strapping requirements is that it's changed several times through the year. The old method of doing it, however, that that was 10 years ago or 6, is not grandfathered in. If you have a glass code scrapping on the water here, that doesn't cut it. It's not grandfathered in. It must be the new code. I think what is the <coughs> the top, the third from the bottom, is two inches wide and made of steel at a certain gauge. And hopefully installed by somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, we saw one not too long ago where there was no stud handy, so they just put a drill hole, put a plastic plug in, and put a bolt in, and you know, uh, stuck a wall. Not probably the best thing to do. The seller is signing saying, This will be done. When you get the art manual, note it, and you check the seller will pay. It's too separate. Things that the seller will pay. That's where we decide who's going to pay. What do you do when you come to the five day and it hasn't been done? That is always a dilemma. Because you're up against the deadline on the loan. And it's a short pay, you're up against the deadline on the vehicles. <coughs> Everybody wants the silly thing closed so we can move in on Saturday because we have the trucks coming. What do you do if these things aren't done? What does it cost to have? Water heater strap in the days. 80 bucks. A little closing gift. We won't make a fuss about it, folks, because if we do, it will stop the escrow until we get it done. We don't want to do that. 
talk about it just to see if Harry will come out from our standard guy that we use and just do that for you and I'll pick up the tab. That way around? It's sort of the more we put on the smoke detector, it's just a little more expensive. I know of no instances in which people have been injured with falling uh, water heaters, even in the earthquake. Uh, even in those days, I was kind of watching this thing. I've been doing this kind of thing for about 20 of my 32 years, and I look for things like that. So it's a relatively obscure occurrence, but it's a very high likelihood. Maybe one of the reasons nobody gets scalded is because these things are strapped. So we want to be sure that that's known. And we want to be sure that the sum of phase is possibly can. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, when, um, I thought I read something recently about smoke detectors have to um, have a lifetime of 10 years. Do you know? That's a new rule that's been set aside for a few years and you don't know exactly what it is. It was going to be a lifetime of 10 years and then they wanted the old houses to have them hardwired. Probably most everything in LA County and, and uh, apartments of common interest have been hardwired for 15 or 18 years. There's a battery that's <coughs> being charged all the time by the, by the power in the transport uh, area, power off the street. Now they want to give it life uh, expectancy, and they also want some additional information put on it. I don't know how many of you love CAR. Um, they're kind of the very thin glue that holds us together. But occasionally they can come down like Lord and Thunder on the wrong side of something. I think if there was a reason to change the specification of smoke detectors based on time, we ought to do it. We don't have to fight it off. Politics, money, taxes, that's a different story. Safety issues, I don't think we should keep those coming. Is it going to be on carbon monoxide? I wonder if all of us putting some of them off until next year. Are they going to? Now here's a little disposition on carbon monoxide detectors. If I'm not careful, I'm going to get you out of here early. That's my guess. Carbon monoxide is found anytime there is combustion. In fact, they specifically exempt homes that do not have any form of uh, fossil burning fuel or wood, not attached to the road. <coughs> How many homes do you know don't have either a fireplace or a gas stove or a gas heater or a gas system? Or Big fat, 50 years ago, all electric homes, no gas. And the price of gas went the price of electricity. <laughs> That's another thing. At some point, you come to an all electric home, you will find that you have to knock off a premium because of that. Eating a home with electricity is no fun anymore. Anyway, it requires that, have, that carbon monoxide detectors be installed on or before January 13th. The January 1st, 2013, Requirement applies to duplex, lodging houses, dormitory hotels, condominiums, timeshare apartments. <coughs> There's exceptions. There are no ownership exemptions except guess who? Exemptions? University of California? State of California? Local government. We have local government agencies that only want housing for some of them. You know, I don't see it very often because you don't get to that part of the county. Not carbon monoxide. How many of you own or manage or involved in some way with rental properties? All of them have carbon monoxide in them? Did you get this big screaming thing that came from all every agency you could think of? If you don't have a license, do that. I don't think anybody's going to die of carbon monoxide, of course, in most of the places that are rented. 
And you don't want to know. You just don't want to take the chance. How many of you have in your own home? Not bad. Where do you put them? Um, is it very clear where they're supposed to go? That's part of the difficulty. The state fire marshal will decide. You'll get my funeral probably before he gets to that. <laughs> <laughs> the difficulty here is that we have these wonderful feel-good legislation actions. And then if something is lost in the transaction. I don't know if a carbon monoxide detector is good four feet off the floor or on the ceiling. There ain't nowhere you can find out. Just have them. <laughs> Mineral placement uh, detectors and applicable properties outside of each sleeping area. <coughs> the hallway, the four bedrooms, is one of those. Or do you have four? Each floor of other water drawings, but additional or different requirements may apply depending on local building standards. The manufacturer's instructions. Tell you what, the best advice you can get on smoke detectors and on carbon monoxide is either a captain of your local engine company or if there's a fire marshal or a battalion chief available in the area where you live, they will know. But we may be different than California. I know Los Angeles is different than everyone. And then you have a smoke detector on each ear in Los Angeles. It's, um, it's a, a little distressing because it varies all over the place. And that's why that's another thing we'll come across. Where are you when you write this? Any of you know where Riverside Drive about the same thing as that? You've all heard of Universal City, actually. Well, Riverside Drive has nice residences on this side, nice residences on this side. And this side is really Universal City. It's an acre, acreage is what, 70, 100, maybe 1,000. It's an entire island of this county. Smoke detectors that apply on the smoke detector application applies on this side of Riverside Drive. It doesn't apply on that side. Which side of the street do you want? Any of you ever live in a house that was built before 1970? Some of you are too young. Some of you are old enough that you could not have done other ones. Why lead? Why do you use lead? Lead is a wonderful element. You can use lead for anything under the sun. It has one sidebar that you probably didn't catch on to for a long, long time. And that is it kills you. <laughs> now, for many, many years, after the beginning of the scientific revolution of the 17th and 18th century, people wondered, because it was pretty good archaeology when it went off through that time, wondered until about the middle of the 19th century why healthily appearing young Roman noblemen and women died sooner than their peasant colleagues that lived out on the farm. They had better nutrition, better health care, such as it was. All of these things, and still, at an average, they died younger. The answer was they were rich, and the rich could afford to have water piped into their house. And what did they pipe it in? Lead. The Latin root for plumber. Plum. Isn't it? And we didn't really recognize that until late, I think, in the 19th century. And then we got to looking at all the things we were looking at. A ship painted with lead paint will not need to be painted nearly as often as one that painted with something else. Gutters and downspouts that are sealed with lead will last forever if they're not. If you ever saw a sewer soil pipe being put into the ground, large or small, they tap over them, and they work. It's kind of poor. And people have hands lead and work lead. Batteries. Batteries were lit for a long time. And people began to pick up these strange diseases. And then it suddenly, you couldn't figure out why children were going nuts or turning into the vegetable. And it turns out that lead in a paint 
begins to go to pieces after what? And where are, where is lead, where is paint, I should say, apt to be neglected and not replaced in lower income areas? And we began to see these phenomena in the ghetto. And we began to see kids that turned out not well. People who were raised in the ghetto, in the barrio, historically have been hungry and so have their children. What does a child do when it's hungry? It chews on anything. A windowsill, a window, a door, dirt from the ground. And there are lead chips in all of those. And we realized that we were killing or ruining the intelligence and the intellectual possibilities of thousands of people. So we said after 1978, no more lead. No more lead in the paint that we use to train houses. But we have this residual problem. Half of our inventory throughout Southern California is 50 years old. I mentioned before, my house, the entire exterior, I have a thick, cute uh, fascia board, about the size of that beam on our plant. It goes all the way around the house. And I know it's made of lead. I bought the house in 64, uh, and I painted it twice of lead and a photo of lead paint went away. So I know it's there. And it's like that all over the place. What we have to do is try and find out where it is. And this form is the first step in doing that. It is statutory. It cannot be waived. The seller must make this disclosure. And you would be surprised how many buyers in the last four or five years who are now selling, how many of them have found out something about the lead crime? Either they got a, a lead report because of their moving in and young kids, they had a gun and people came out and sealed it. It's perfectly harmless. It's like asbestos. Once it's sealed, it doesn't harm at all. And they have reports from what they do. Or grandfather did something before he built the house to them, before he, they, they bought it from him. And there was lead paint, lead paint put on good, it's been covered by coats of acrylic and it's been certified. <coughs> a lot of these reports, a lot of these forms come back with this initial information. One of the reasons to get this to a, uh, a buyer early is so they can, if they want to invoke their 10 days additional time to get them inspected, they have the longest possible time. Sometimes it takes a while to get it all that time. They have to do auger tests, sometimes they do sand tests, and all kinds of things that these experts do to tell you yes or no, there is lead or no, there is lead. And it's terribly, terribly important. Now, I personally have never lived in a house that doesn't have asbestos and doesn't have lead. And you make the case I'm crazy, but my lungs are good. Anyway, here's the landlord's disclosure. Take a look at page two. Here, my friend, is when you become a federal enforcement officer. I didn't know you were, did you? Well, we'll see other places where you enforce federal law, where you enforce state law, where you were obligated to do so by statute. Read what that paragraph says. Agent has informed the seller or landlord of seller to landlord's obligation under Article 42 of the United States Code. 4852D and is aware of agent's responsibility to ensure compliance. I'm not giving you it. I'm not going to give you this form. You have to. I won't. Bang. I'll take you. How do you enforce it? Agent's responsibility to ensure compliance of this disclosure is made or is required by law. I have reviewed the information above and certified the rest of my knowledge that the information provided is true and correct. And you sign it. But wait, there's more. Look at the next paragraph. This is the cooperating agent. 
The agent has informed the seller or landlord to the listing agent if the property is listed of the seller's or landlord's obligation under Article blah, 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 and is aware of agent's responsibility to ensure compliance. I'm sorry it isn't listed, and there's no listing agent to go against, and I have to ensure that this will be been kind enough to take my buyer in compliance with this law? Yeah. That's what the law says. Federal law. It's a next question. What are your responsibilities like? Just don't get killed. Um, don't, don't let people get violent with you over this kind of thing. Anybody hear anything new today? This afternoon? Stuff you haven't thought about for a long time, you haven't heard before. That's what we try to do. I try to explain why we do what we do, but sometimes I can't explain why we do it. We just have to. Uh, I think the agency is a very interesting example of why we do what we do. We'll have more examples as we go along. I encourage you to ask questions. This is a little different than before. We previously would simply pass out each unit as we come to the day. Now you have one unit in there. If you want to go through and underline the question marks as you come to them, you'll do that. I will not probably address anything in units that are ahead of us. We occasionally go back and do things to the units that are behind us. Um, most of what you have heard today is slightly different than what you would have heard before because things have changed just slightly. Also, much of what you have heard today will not be valid after November. Last November, of the forms that we use consistently in real estate, 20 percent, I'm sorry, 20 individual forms were modified and seven new were issued. We'll address them as we go through this. Most of you who subscribe to CAR's newsline have already seen the proposed new RPACA. It is the most radical change in any form that I have seen in 32 years. We are really just kind of dumping the blood out of the baby and putting the transfusion at the top. It is going to be significantly different than what we discuss here in the next few weeks, but you've got to live until November with what's here. If you want to come back? Now we won't do we won't do one of these after November. We'll probably do another session some time in July uh, August. There won't be significant changes in April, there may be some. But practically everything that we have discussed here will be in some measure, large or small, obsolete by this time next week. This is a dynamic business. They don't pay you the big bucks to hide your hand in the sand. You don't make a fortune making mistakes, but you will make mistakes. There isn't a person with whom I affiliate in this office that hasn't heard me say, I expect you to make mistakes. You can't help it. You're going to make mistakes. Part of what we're trying to do here is minimize it. At the outset, I said, if you can remember that there is something to remember, you're ahead of me. Just remember that there's, there's something weird about the SPQ. There's something weird about certifying that I have seen that the lead-based paint disclosure has been made. If you can't remember what it is, it's not a sin. The 72 forms joined 185 of the 202 pages. And these are just basic. Don't expect to know them, and don't expect to be utterly error-free. The nice thing about real estate is that they're usually time and a little bit to tie them up. If you think you're in trouble, and you know you're in trouble, then go be a broker. You're most of us pretty good at risk management. And occasionally, we can get in there and stop the fire before it gets too wide and spread. I expect to make mistakes. I expect to have down days in this business. Mostly, if you like it, it's a great business. See, so we protect the mold. Is there a separate mold disclosure in the DR? Or there is not a mold disclosure that is addressed in several places. Is there, yeah, the 